Dr. Ian Corbett, BI Geology Honors, uh, MSc, PhD, Advanced Management. Ian has an extensive research and field experience in major diamond, gold, and platinum placer provinces of the world. He worked as a consulting geologist, placer, and intellectual capital manager for the Beers Exploration and Operations Division prior to establishing an international consultancy in knowledge management. Now retired, he has a continuing interest in the West Coast sedimentology. Over to Ian. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, a lot of friends in the audience I see, so nice to be in touch with people again. Um, my talk this afternoon is not going to really touch on the geology of the West Coast very much, um, but uh, some of the people and, and uh, some of the experiences that, that people have had over the um, many years of development of the West Coast offshore operations. And it's a sort of lead in to perhaps John, but specifically into um, Urban's talk later. Um, my journey with De Beers personally started um, back in 1982 when I met a guy called Mike DeVitt at the University of Reading, where we were both doing an MSc in Applied Sedimentology. And uh, one of our more memorable moments is probably on the banks of the, the Severn River, trying to get a core out of a freezing um, mud in 1983. And um, through Mike, uh, Barry Hawthorne offered me a, a position um, working in arrangement, and uh, that saw me arrive um, in 1983, October 83, um, to start working in a place called Bogenfels, which uh, some of you might be familiar with. When I, um, when I arrived in arrangement, I was uh, picked up from the airport by a woman called Ali Manning, and um, Ali became my wife in 1985, and uh, she was the first lady to live out in Bogenfels since 1954. And um, that was made possible by Ronnie Hazel, who I'm not sure if he's in the audience today, but Ronnie was, um, was instrumental in, in making it possible for Ali to join me. And as you can see, um, Bogenfels is quite a remote and rather desolate place, and I rather underestimated the impact that would have on my um, newly married wife. And um, she then started to look for things to do, and one of the things that she um, came up with was to become an author. And uh, Ali wrote a book um, called Diamond Beaches, looking at the history of arrangement and uh, also as our diamond sorter working on the prospecting plant, um, ably helped by our, our little black cat. Coming to the more serious part of the talk now, um, many of you will be familiar with the fact that Zacharias Luala is accredited with having found the first diamonds on the West Coast in 1908. And, um, the talk today is really is really the product of that uh, that man's discovery, and uh, as as was noted by um, early visitors to the coast, it's a desolate place. And one of the most remarkable stories that that can really be told is how the uh, the, the overall mining of those deposits actually evolved because it was an, a remarkable journey in itself, almost as remarkable as the journey of the diamonds that John and Urban will be talking about later. The actual discovery came quite late really in, in terms of looking at other rushes around the world. There'd been many major gold rushes in, in the Americas, um, prior to that time. And there'd even been quite a lot of visitors to the West Coast, um, going right back to the early explorers who came through in the late 1480s. Um, we had guano 
um, rushes to the coast in the um, 1843 to 1845. And it's well documented that many of those people actually went on shore. And uh, a, a company called the Pass Spence and Co. then in 1863 actually opened a copper mine um, right uh, next door to Pomona, where the biggest discovery was waiting in a valley called the Eidatal, but that was only discovered in 1908. And the rush on the West Coast actually went through until the marine beaches were discovered, initially by Jack Carstens in the Mequiland in 1925, and then in 1928, the discoveries in, in Namibia at the Orange Mouth um, led to the development of, of the deposits that John will be talking about later. So there were people all around, but remarkably, given that many of the diamonds lay on the surface of the, of the desert, and the initial mining activity was to crawl across it on one's hands and knees and actually pick up diamonds. And I've been able to do that in my working life. Um, picked up a number of stones in, in, in the Pomona area. And um, August Stauch, it's claimed, went south with Professor Scheib riding on horseback from Coleman's Cop. It was supposedly Scheib's first ever venture out on a horse. And it is, it's, it's legend in, or myth in um, arrangement that Stauch was able to carry on prospecting with Scheib in the moonlight in the desert because there were so many diamonds lying on the surface of a remarkable valley called the Eidatal, which is next door to another remarkable valley called the Hexen Castle, and uh, not quite as remarkable perhaps as the Merangi um, deposits in some respects, but one sample in the Hexen Kessel, 20 meters long and a few, uh, one meter wide and less than five centimeters um, deep produced nearly 2000 diamonds. And even the Germans were totally surprised by that. The area has seen many extraordinary geologists over the hundred years or so that it's um, been a, a an operating area for diamond um, mining. And Klinghart was probably one of the most remarkable of those people. And, and many people attribute the initial success to Klinghart's ability to survive in this arid land. He had a remarkable knack of finding water. He um, worked a lot with um, Bushmen and um, through him, Many of the early people were able to survive and, um, and prospect in areas which were really desolate and off the map for most. Early on, there were some remarkable recoveries by August Stauch. And it actually, this, this particular diamond is one of many, 112 carats. Um, there were many diamonds in the Eidatal that were between 40 to 60 carats that were recovered. And um, that fact led Stauch to believe that somewhere close by was a primary source. And he in fact used most of the fortune that he made through his work in Namibia to try and discover the primary source and never did. And, and in the process, lost a fortune. And these diamonds were relatively unknown until a metal trunk was discovered in a shed that was being cleared in arrangement by some engineers looking for some extra space way back in the 80s, possibly 90s, I don't remember exactly when. And in that trunk were the original notebooks from the German prospectors who prospected the trenches cut across the valleys in, in the Spachgebiet. And uh, the, the remarkable thing of those notebooks was that they recorded all of the large stone sizes and it was really quite incredible and, and interesting to see how many 
stones of plus 60 carats were recovered from those areas where the average stone size was, was much closer to 0.2.3 stones to the carat. One of the things that was amazing when I arrived in that particular part of the world, Bogenfels, and later lived in Pomona and then up in Luderitz, was to see the technology that advanced through those areas in such a short time. A rail system was put in from south to north and, and uh, in no time at all, man was replaced by large machines. And one of the most audacious areas that, that a bucket excavator could possibly have worked is on the margins of the Namib Sansi where overburden was stripped from areas to the north of Colmanskop and Luderitz itself. And some of those machines are still standing in the desert today. Um, absolutely incredible tenacity and engineering capability that brought these technologies to Namibia in, 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 in a time, 1913, I mean, it, it, it used to just blow one's mind to see what these people achieved under the most difficult of circumstances. At the same time, there were a number of really amazing geologists that worked in the area. Eric Kaiser was one of them. He was actually a paleontologist mainly, and um, he was commissioned to bring a volume together, um, became two volumes. In fact, it's a beautiful piece of work that um, includes maps going from almost uh, Shamais Bay all the way through to um, north of Luderitz. And he worked with a number of different geologists, including Beats, to compile a, a, a paleontological record of the deposits. Unfortunately, at the time, they were not allowed to discuss the economics. And so, although it's touched on in places in those volumes, there's very little in terms of actual detail. And, and it's a great loss that, that that never took place. But the technology advance continued and, and Elizabeth Bay in the 1930s, just to the south of Luderitz, became an absolute showcase for the most advanced mining technologies of its time. And um, it was it a was, uh, very short-lived operation, unfortunately, um, given the, the um, recession and, and the impact that it had on those areas. But it, it showed again what could be achieved in very different circumstances. But the real thing that was going on in the background to all of this was the search for the ultimate source. And I know that John will be talking about some aspects of this, so I'm not gonna talk very much about it. But one of the things that, that happened in those early stages in 1910, in fact, was a geologist by the name of Ernst Reuning spent some time down on the Orange River and actually put trenches in. And he was recalled back to Luderitz by the management team before he was able to assess what those trenches might have shown. And it's, it's widely believed that it had, it, had Reuning been able to actually complete that piece of work, he would have been able to um, put two and two together and, and, and uh, identify the Orange River for its major role that it's played in developing the, the Namibian placer deposits. Another missed opportunity was a, um, Fred Cornell, who was killed in a motorbike accident in the early, um, early 1900s, I think somewhere around 1916 um, in London. And it's widely believed that he was looking for, for financing to have a more in-depth look at the Orange River, but that never took place because he was, um, he was killed before he could take it forward. One man who did manage to meet his destiny was a chap called Jack Carstens. Um, his book, A Fortune Through My Fingers, was republished uh, re, um, 
a few years ago. And uh, it's a remarkable story, really. Uh, it's a good read. And um, Carstens didn't have a lot of time for geologists. He was very friendly with Hans Morensky and he really liked the man. But in terms of um, acknowledging that Morensky had come up with the, the oyster line theory and that he'd been ahead of the game, um, Carstens never took that seriously at all. Um, he was an out and out uh, prospector and um, not one to mince his words when it, when it came to um, other people's attempts to um, to go out and find diamonds. Um, he didn't have a lot of time for um, Fred Cornell either, but he managed to find one of the world's great alluvial deposits, marine deposits in the form of the Clancy deposits. Um, the, um, the discovery in arrangement was uh, was obviously a major breakthrough, and um, initially, a lot of the work was done by people with um, mule-drawn um, cocoa pans. And over a period of time, there was quite rapid expansion again, and a number of different types of technology came into play, particularly with the use of bucket wheel excavators and um, those those advances took place um, through through the 1940s 1950s as you'd see in Ali's book on Di um, diamond beaches and in um, Garby Schneider's book uh, on treasures of the Sperkebeet but at the same time as that development was happening, an interesting event occurred when the Ernest Oppenheimer Bridge was put in in 1962. The piling for that bridge never reached the bedrock. And um, of course, hindsight's perfect science, but, but it's, it's easy to say now that that was probably the first weak signal that a wacky idea like the possibility of diamonds being on the continental shelf could have been a, a, a good idea. And um, those, they, those piles went down, I think they went down over 80 meters into the bed of the river. Um, so it started to, to suggest that there might be extensions in the offshore, but it was only when a guy called Sammy Collins came to the coast, um, contracted to put a diesel pipeline in for what was called CDM then, now NAMDEB, where the fleet of, of vehicles had expanded to the point that the need for diesel fuel was enormous. And Collins was a Texan with, a, with an appetite for adventure and um, was definitely not scared of wild ideas. And he's reputed to have stood on the beach um, with some of the people, including a guy called Charles Stocken, and said to the people, well, if there are diamonds on the beaches, has anyone looked out there pointing out into the Atlantic Ocean? And that was the start of the journey that would see the transition from onshore to offshore um, exploration and the whole development of De Beers Marine um, and the deep water mining. The vessel that started it all was quite a humble vessel. It was just a small um, tug called the Emerson K. It was introduced in 1961. And um, the initial discovery of diamonds up in uh, Shamice and then in Hottentots Bay led to the very rapid expansion of the Collins Empire. Um, through an organization called the Marine Diamond Corporation. And Collins um, started uh, up in Namibia in 1961 when he was awarded a licenses there. And then in 1962, he was also awarded extensive licenses for something called the Southern Diamond Corporation uh, offshore of Namaqualand. Collins was larger than life. There are many stories. There's a lovely book by Roger Williams on, on Sammy Collins giving the history. And, um, you yeah, know, some people, it's always interesting because you get these different 
different perspectives on people. Some people have stories about a, a gun slinging wild Texan. Um, and there are some remarkable pictures of Sammy Collins purportedly standing on barges halfway out of the water. Um, but at the same time, he was a man who who was not afraid of a challenge and he was actively involved. And a diver himself, he um, he went and, and uh, really got into the whole thing and started to look at these deposits. Um, and it was, again, a, ca a case of rapid innovation. And uh, they chose to use mining barges that were um, built in Cape Town. And uh, the first one came in in 1962 called Barge 77. And um, they had a, a very simple approach to, to mining using a steel digging head. Um, the vessels were accompanied by a tug so that they could um, take, use the tug to um, move the anchors. And uh, the, the whole plant was on board. It was a completely integrated unit. And it was the first of the offshore diamond mining ventures. By 1963, there were three production vessels in Shamais Bay, and uh, ultimately a number of them ran aground, sadly, with, with the result that um, some lives were lost. It was a dangerous occupation. But um, the last barge to be built was a vessel called the Pomona, an absolutely enormous unit, and that one um, came into service in 1967. It's estimated that more than a million carats was produced from the shallow water area in Shamais between 1963 and 1971. And in 1971, um, the view was that those deposits had been depleted. But it was also a very interesting time in terms of the geological work that was being done. And perhaps um, one of the best examples of this is a paper that was published by um, Murray and Roy Joint um, and a few other people in 1970. And um, this paper came about through a, a lot of work that was done um, both by a contracted company called the o Ocean Science and Engineering Company and also um, AAC Anglo-American Corporation in 1964 established their own oceanographic research unit and uh, it, it consisted of a number of different people. I could only find photographs of a few of them, unfortunately. Um, Dick Foster was one of them who, who led De Beers Marine for many years and then Tony Hockney was another. Tony had a, a real gift for um, doing wave modeling exercises and uh, was fantastic at being able to um, interpret the topographic effects on um, wave refraction and, and where to go and look for diamonds. One of the nicest models that came out at that time was a, was a, a piece of work because of the importance of gullies um, as trap sites, fixed trap sites on the seabed. One of the best pieces of work that I've ever seen done was, was published by Murray in, the, in this paper um, with his other co-workers, and uh, that summarised the development of um, shore platforms on the Namibian coast, and it really was a beautiful piece of work, and there were a number of different styles of gully were identified, and you can imagine that the detailed information and the knowledge and expertise that evolved through these folk diving um, repeatedly in these deposits and mining them by hand with, with pumps was quite remarkable. Um, and that carried on into, into um, fairly recent times. And even now there are still diving operations that are active. Um, it was, a, it was, it's been estimated that Namibian production from diving operations in the near shore was somewhere around 70,000 to 100,000 carats a year, just to give you a, a feel for the scale of those operations. 
one of the things that that became evident early in in the development of the um, Namibian onshore beaches was that trap sites are really important and the nugget effect is very crucial to understand as well. And some of the best work that was done in terms of being able to deal with the difficulties of estimating the mineral resource um, was done by Tina Zusterfeld with um, Vaynant Kleinkeld. And you can see here, for those of you uh, living in the Overberg, a, a more youthful version of Ronnie Hazel as well in this particular photograph, which was taken in 1989. Um, one of the things that one needs to understand, and I guess the guys will be discussing this a bit later too, is that marine diamond deposits are, are relatively low grade. They certainly don't come anywhere near the Marangi deposits that uh, in, that were being discussed earlier in terms of um, the types of grades that, that are experienced. And uh, we're dealing with parts per billion. So sampling is really important and how you go about it. And that was always a controversial topic with people like Jack Carstens, who, whose backgrounds were very much get out there and do it and, and follow your nose and, 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 your, your, um, and your gut. Um, when, you've run, when you're running a really big operation where a vessel can cost well over a billion um, rand or Namibian dollars, you're, you're dealing with, with incredible quantities of money that need to be invested carefully and, and uh, risk has to be managed. And between Tinas and, and Vaynant, the work that they did was quite remarkable in being able to, to help to improve that process of uh, resource estimation and uh, ultimately um, the transformation into reserves. Initially on the onshore side, one metre trenches were used extensively, but those were found to be inadequate. And so 10 metre trenches were used um, ultimately to do a lot of the evaluation of the onshore deposits. And, and that was really um, driven by the need to try and intersect um, the trap site so that you could get an idea of, uh, of the overall grade distribution in an area. But it became clear as those developments went on and the mining progressed that Namibian uh, raised beaches are quite remarkable in terms of their, um, their, their placer grades. And the, as uh, Tania was saying earlier, the quality of the diamonds is also remarkable. And so, so it was that people started to um, think about how could they extend the mining onshore to be able to reach offshore and go into the shallow water and see if those deposits really did carry on. And so the early, the early skew prism wall was invented and uh, in those days, it was um, it was a, a very um, potentially dangerous op operation. And uh, yeah, the storms that hit the Namibian coast are one of the key factors in developing those diamond deposits, but they also make it extremely difficult to build sand walls and keep the keep the ocean back as Canute found. And one of the people that overcame that initial challenge was a guy called Dr. Harry Swart, an, a coastal engineer working for the CSIR, who really kind of laid the foundation for developing the science behind the seawall. And um, through him and his team in the CSIR, working with the mining department in Aranyament, they were able to start to move the seawall out. And so it was that that the seawall started to be extended as overburden was stripped. Um, the dumping of the sand and, and um, overburden onto the coastline and the use of um, quite sophisticated pumping systems allowed the Atlantic Ocean to be held back. And so the sea the seawall started to move out. And through that, they were able to start to access the wave cut platforms below sea level, initially pushing out to minus 20 meters below sea level. But um, when my last visit to, to um, the mining area one in, in Aranyament, 
uh, many moons ago now, they were actually at minus 31 meters below sea level. And it's, a, it's quite an, uh, an experience to stand in the open air under the sunshine and experience the fact that you've got the roaring Atlantic um, crashing into a seawall and that you're 30 meters underwater effectively. It's, it's, a, it's quite something to get one's head around it. And uh, the scale of the stripping operations were, were one of the thing that allowed that initial development of the sea wall, which began to push out hundreds of meters into the Atlantic. Um, bucket wheel excavators were introduced in the mid seventies and uh, the, the, the size of the system was increased in 1987 and then um, dredges were used as well. And, it, and what's quite exciting is to see that that, that technology is now being taken forward um, by the Southern Coastal Mining team in Namdeb and they're still getting out into, into the Atlantic. And you know, the possibility is that they may even one day go beyond 30 meters below sea level, which I find absolutely amazing. And there's some great papers by um, Stephen um, Kirkpatrick and uh, a chap called Mukendwa and a couple of others that, that I can recommend you get hold of if you're interested in having a look at that. It's quite remarkable to see the, the um, bedrock trap sites that are being uncovered. But in the 19, late 1960s, a chap called Hoyt discovered that there were some remarkable channels preserved on the continental shelf off the Orange River mouth. And he started to uh, a, a real thought that perhaps the Orange River had extended way out onto the continental shelf. And so this was the stirring of a notion and it raised doubts as to whether, or questions as to whether there might be diamonds out on the continental shelf in depths beyond where Sammy Collins could reach. And so the initial jump to deep water mining started. And um, it was in the 70s that, that the initial work was done really to go out and discover whether there was anything out there or whether that was just science fiction. And in 1994, the production offshore was about 400,000 carats a year. And today, I believe it's now over a million, but I'm sure that Urban will be talking to that in his talk. Pioneering exploration into deep water took place in, in, in the 60s. They started to push out um, and extended from 35 meters way out to 200 meters water depth with surveying and coring with vessels called the Rock Eater and the Ontgener. And then initially the, the, um, the excitement started when initial samples started to produce positive results. There were many negative results as well, um, which created a lot of difficulties for people like Tinas and Vaynant to get their heads around when it came to estimating the true mineral resource that's out on the shelf. But um, the, the real work then started and the delineation of the deposit and the development of the resource. And when the scale of, of the discovery was became evident, then De Beers Marine was formed in 1983. And it was through an engineer called DJ Van Yarsfeldt, who, who really threw the gauntlet down and, and said, right, 1986, I believe, he said, you, you either turn this operation into a production operation or we, or we stop it. You can't just keep going on exploring and developing the mineral resource. We now have to make that transition into mining. And... Uh, and so in 1987, the Louis Murray was um, brought into operation and a number of different types of crawler unit were tested on the Louis Murray after initially trying a, a system called the traversing digging head, which, which proved to not be efficient. 
But as knowledge started to evolve and, and it became abundantly clear that the seabed was anything but sandy and smooth and in fact was extremely rugged with vast quantities of head-sized cobbles and boulders down on it, together with very large slabs, um, some of them in excess of 10 or 15 meters in diameter. It started to be abundantly clear that more than one type of um, mining system was going to be needed. And in 1991, the Coral Sea was purchased and um, converted from an oil exploration drill ship into a large diameter drill ship for suitable for mining. The initial test work was, was remarkable. Um, one of the big challenges proved to be actually slowing down the material that was brought up from the seabed. You can imagine when you've got cobbles the size of someone's head traveling at 15 meters per second, when it arrives on surface, slowing it down and keeping it under control is quite an interesting challenge. But the engineers tackled that and so, the real work started and um, tailoring those systems to be able to deal with these very tough conditions, which are never shown by vibracores. Vibracores always show you nice little pebbles and it looks very easy. But when you look at side scan sonar, as you can see in this um, slide with the gray image in the background, these are big slabs of, of um, Eocene and Cretaceous sandstones lying down on the seabed. And uh, mining systems have to be able to negotiate those because those ultimately are trap sites. And um, they're very interesting places to be able to go and mine. So moving from the crawler to the drill ship, it became um, very important to be able to really determine what the conditions on the seabed were and, and what type of uh, system was gonna be required in order to be able to most efficiently extract the diamonds from the coarse gravels that lie on the surface. Some of the gravels are less than a meter thick, others uh, can be up to several meters thick and depends where you are in the deposit. And so one of the challenges that my team was faced with in the late 90s was, was developing resources, but also being able to transform those resources into reserves whilst managing the risk associated with that so that the investment in ships could be um, managed appropriately, but also we could start to estimate what type of production was going to be possible. And, um, we were always challenged by the fact that we needed to be within 15% of our predictions, both on a mine, both on a monthly basis, but also on an annual basis. Um, so it was very difficult to get uh, resources into the proved category. So most of the resources we were dealing with were in the probable category. And, it, and I always felt that, that the acid test was how close you could stay to the mine plan. And mine planning became more complicated as the fleet grew. Um, all, of the, all of the vessels were using um, chains. None of the vessels were um, using dynamic positioning, which meant that you had vast arrays of chains with anchors down on the seabed. And you had to be able to plan so that you could get the right vessel into the right area of the deposit and, and it had to be safe. And um, and so this started a process of developing quite complex linear programs to be able to support that type of work. And at the same time, because you, you're, you're um, separated from, from the drill bit by as much as 130 meters of, of the Atlantic Ocean, um, it became really important to look for visualization technologies that would allow um, very close to real time monitoring of the of the actual mining equipment. And there have been major advances in these areas um, over the years since since I was involved. But from a geology point of view, the early 90s was was a very challenging time because uh, we were being challenged by the mining department to be able to predict closer and closer to reality. 
and um, and so we started to need to improve the way that we could do that and uh, one of the main one of the main pieces of kit that we we acquired in in the 90s was uh, a tow fish called um, a focus 400 and that allowed us to start to really close down our line spacing and using a surface towed um, piece of equipment we were able to get down to line spacings of as little as 12 and a half meters. So we were one of the world's highest resolution survey teams um, working in, in the ocean environment. And one of the big challenges was to be able to move away from the initial paper records and be able to go to digital um, data and to be able to look at data visualization. And again, there've been some remarkable changes in, in how that's done. But one of my challenges was, was to get everybody calibrated, including myself as to what we were really dealing with. And so, um, in 1996, we, we um, contracted Hans Fricker from the Max Planck Institute with his team to come out and um, put their Jago submersible onto the MV Zealous, our, our survey ship. And we took it out to sea and we started to do submersible dives out onto the continental shelf. Um, some of those dives went down the Cape Canyon as well, ultimately down to about 400 meters below sea level, which was a remarkable experience. But one of the neat things with the, with the Jago was that the Jago is quite small and, um, and it would fit into the sampling holes that were being drilled by the Coral Sea as much as a couple of meters or so into the seabed. So some of the geologists were able to go down and look in three dimensions at the, at the drill holes that they were putting through the deposit into the foot wall below. And, and it was a very exciting time. Um, major advances in terms of being able to understand the nature of the deposits. And, and one of the beauties of De Beers Marine was that the positioning um, for tracking the Jago was remarkably good. So we could, we could work out to within less than two meters where we were. And in one of the dives that was done by Rob Smart, the, the AGM at the time, of De Beers Marine in 126 meters of water, we, we um, found uh, uh, the Jago was actually moving around and, and on, on the surface, you could see it moving from side to side. And, and uh, actually it was the swell coming through was actually running on the seabed in 126 meters of water. And it actually picked up the Jago and rammed it into um, a, a rocky outcrop. And it was, uh, it was stuck there for a while. And I think that was one of Rob's um, most uh, memorable experiences in, in terms of his West Coast days. For us, it was all about improving the mineral resource. The Douglas Bay was the, the main vessel that was being being used for sampling, um, but, but uh, as we got more um, detailed knowledge of the resource through mining and the reserve particularly, then it became clear that we needed to improve the technology and the Coral Sea was converted into a, 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 a sampling vessel and uh, it, it, it could switch between sampling and mining. And uh, the drill bit that was being used was, was um, 10 meters, uh, 10 square meters. So um, those, those started to make quite big differences in terms of the confidence in the evaluation. One of the most exciting um, projects that we undertook was to replace the Zealous. The Zealous was a 72 meter vessel. It had a crew of 56 and we replaced it with a three meter AEV. Um, and uh, it was a really neat project and it, it was really made possible by the belief of, of Brian Ainsley and Paul Dixon Savage in the in the team that was put together. The team was led by Paul Nicholson, who I believe is is probably retiring this year, I think, with um, he was the lead in the geophysics department in um, De Beers Marine working for me. And we partnered with a company initially called Maridan, but renamed to Martin, um, led by a guy called Jens Pind. 
and it was a it was a marriage made in heaven because we had the practical skills from from the zealous of um, very very high resolution work and uh, Jens and his team had remarkable capability in terms of developing the AUV and that took line spacing down to um, two and a half meters but it also quadrupled the resolution of the day so more and and that's been surpassed now as well and so as you can see by the graph here the the efficiency of the data acquisition just went up and up and um, I've been looking at some of this data recently and it's just fantastic absolutely brilliant so the story from a knowledge management point of view has been an interesting one. Um, one of the, I published a paper um, a few years ago, now 2014, um, looking at performance through learning. And uh, one of the things that one had noticed over the years was that there's about a 30 year cycle of knowledge and um, and development on the west coast that that has taken place over the years and um and and the sea wall is a very good example of that another good example is developing in terms of the offshore at the moment with the development of initial development in the mid 80s um, of the of the mining fleet um, and some remarkable work was done in terms of technology development by um led by Kevin Richardson and a number of other engineers and it's been absolutely brilliant to see how they've gone and it'll be very exciting to see how they go into the future so um, enjoy the rest of the talks on the west coast it's been a love affair of mine for many years and uh, I hope you've enjoyed the talk thanks very much thanks Ian that was fantastic so so Ellie's written two books when's yours coming along ah uh, no that's uh, that's that's possibly never going to happen. I should say, actually, I, I didn't show the slide, but there, there are several books that I've used in compiling this. Um, maybe I'll just show those quickly, John, if you don't mind. Um, no, go for it, please. And you can also send us, uh, you know, even images of the covers and we'll put it on the, you know, mail it to everyone. Yeah, It'd be fantastic. Yeah, I'll do that with pleasure. Um, Okay, take note, students. There's your reading material for the rest of the week. <laughs> yeah, this. I mean, it's, it, it's been interesting. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of people, sadly, that are no longer with us, and um, yeah, very hard to find pictures of all of the people that have really contributed to this talk and and the work that's been done, which which is a very sad reflection. But it's been a lovely thing to be able to go back. Started with Olga Levinson, then then Ali with Diamond Beaches, um, which came out initially as a as a black and white paper, um, a soft cover, and then fortunately Namdeb commissioned her to do an up, update on that. Uh, and so I think that book might might still be available in in the spa in arraignment, but I'm not sure. And then of course Garby Schneider's book Treasures of the Diamond Coast is a fantastic text with a remarkable amount of very useful detail. Um, Diamond People was a book that was put together by De Beers many moons ago. Glamour of Prospecting, Fred Cornell, Fortune Through My Fingers, Jack Carstens, King of Sea oh, Diamonds, Roger Williams. Uh, Mike DeVitt features with Prospecting in Africa because there's a very neat paper by Daryl Hallam that uh, really was a benchmark paper and then um, this book look, performance through learning is uh, where that last image was was initially published although that's a bit out of date now yeah interesting i, I also found another copy of by the, the bay of diamonds by fun um about um, the alex the early days of the alex core deposit which is also fascinating I Ooh, sent that would copy be interesting to, copy to Urban the other day. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll I'd be very one. interested to see that actually. Yeah, yeah. that would be very interesting because there's not there's not a heck of a lot that's available on Alex Core. There were some really nice things um, published by Pete Kresser back yeah. in the mid '80s, but not not a lot's come out. Ian, if I may, in closure, ask uh, you never crossed uh, swords with the environmentalists. 
<laughs> there have been lots of environmentalists actually one of one of the neat things i mean i i can't speak for today because i i'm you know no longer involved in those operations but i know that there's a huge amount of work done both by namdeb and through de beers marine namibia on on the environmental side and and actually the offshore recovery is quite quick it's just a few years and and uh, one of the neat things with the jago was that uh, several hundred hours of dives were done with that submersible which sadly has recently been retired and um, a lot of that footage was interpreted by a team in um, UWC and uh, it's one of the best records of, of pelagic fish in the oceans um, so yeah there's been a lot done actually no, I mean, you have to give credit to yourselves and the beers. I mean, the work done, particularly with the Jago and on the seabed and the recovery and the, the repopulation was amazing. And um, I guess, you know, you guys were leaders in that respect. Yeah, I think a lot of it came down to um, Patty Wickens and, and a lady, I can't remember Leslie's name now, um, surname, but uh, they, they, they put together the most fantastic program. And um, yeah, that laid the foundation really for a lot of the work that's been ongoing, I'm sure. Yeah. But thanks, Ian, yeah. that was fantastic. So, and, and really think you need to give a, a bit of attention to writing up your you know, rather unique and very special um, experiences on the West Coast. No, thanks, John. You've, you've, done, uh, you've done some of the hard work now for, you know, <laughs> for the presentation, so don't stop there. Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm busy at the moment putting a training program together, so um, maybe that's going to, maybe that will evolve, we'll see. <laughs>